This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Get two months of free access to thousands of courses by visiting the link in the description. Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, is the busiest shopping day of the year in the United States. Stores often offer great deals to entice shoppers, sometimes called doorbusters, because people literally bust down the door to get to the sale price merchandise before it sells out. It's consumerism at its most aggressive. All of those shoppers need places to park. Retail store parking lots are often sized to be large enough to handle Black Friday-sized crowds because the last thing the retailers want is to turn away shoppers who can't find a place to park. But what if retailers overbuilt their parking? You'd have a waste of space, paid for no reason. That parking could have been better used as leasable buildings, earning money, instead of costing a retailer money to pave and maintain it. And parking lots, especially overbuilt ones, can spread out buildings and make cities less walkable and generally a lot uglier. So if there are any empty parking spaces on Black Friday, the busiest day of the year, it means that the parking lots are overbuilt. So in this video, I'm going to put the parking lots of two shopping centers to the test. Will there be excess parking? Let's see what we find and learn a little about parking along the way. Before I share the results of my little parking survey, I want to tell you about my strategy and hypothesis. My plan was pretty simple. At the most basic level, I wanted to go to a couple of retail districts here in the Sacramento region and see how many parking spaces were left on Black Friday. I also wanted to have a control or baseline count, so I looked at the parking situation the week before, too. That way I could also see how much more popular Black Friday is for shoppers when compared to a more normal weekend day. I chose two sites for this little experiment. The first site is the Roseville Galleria. It's a massive indoor mall that opened in 2000 and expanded later to become the largest shopping mall in the Sacramento area. It's anchored by a JCPenney's, Macy's, and Nordstrom. There are a lot of swanky brands too, but more importantly, the Galleria has the only good reason to go to a mall, the Lego store. The Galleria is so serious about parking that it has two parking garages. There's a two-story one over here and a four-story one on the other side. Adjacent to the Galleria is the Fountains at Roseville, a lifestyle center. Basically, it's a fancy outdoor mall anchored by Whole Foods. I did a whole video on the topic of lifestyle centers, so go check it out if you want. There's also additional retail to the east, but I didn't include it in my survey because I already had enough to look at. I also chose a site in the Natomas area of Sacramento, north of the American River. This shopping area is not the regional draw that the Roseville Galleria is, but it's still a large shopping district that serves a significant part of Sacramento. The northeastern half of the area is anchored by a Target, and includes shopping center staples, Barnes & Noble, and Bed Bath and & Beyond. There's also a Best Buy over here. This area also includes the Promenade, a failed lifestyle center. Seriously, this place is a ghost town compared to the fountains at Roseville. In the southwest part of the Natomas Retail District, there's a Home Depot, Staples, Walmart, and a movie theater. These are two large shopping areas, but because they serve different roles, I hypothesize that the parking situation would be different on Black Friday. I thought that the Roseville Galleria would max out its parking. It has some luxury brands that the other shopping centers don't, which could be a big draw on Black Friday. The Natomas area is anchored by Target and Walmart. They will have doorbusters for sure, but now these happen the day before on Thanksgiving. And there are plenty of Targets and Walmarts in the region, so I figure there may be more parking spaces than necessary in Natomas. Armed with my hypotheses, I hopped into my minivan and made my way deep into the suburbs. I started at the Roseville Galleria on November 23rd. I did a quick aerial survey at around 11 a.m. and found it to be reasonably busy. Most of the main parking lots were full or nearly full, with only a few aisles having significant parking available. The results were the same over in the fountains at Roseville. I noticed that there are clearly two overflow parking lots, one at the Galleria and another at the fountains. I was definitely interested to see if they would fill up in a week. Again, you can't get a sense for the parking garage from above, so I decided to head in and check it out to see what the parking situation was in there. I found it about half full. I didn't drive into the second smaller parking garage, but it looked about half full when I drove by. So that's our gallery of baseline. About a month before Christmas, it was busy, but not at max capacity. Now let's look at Natomas. There were considerably more vacant spaces in the target part of the Natomas Center than in the Roseville Galleria, and that's probably because, besides maybe Daiso, there's really not much retail to draw many cars over to this section. Perhaps this is the equivalent to overflow parking for this center. Also, the Ashley Furniture Home Store wasn't really drawing in the crowds. As expected, the promenade was basically empty. The Walmart half of Natomas was busier, and there were far fewer empty spaces. Before we get to the Black Friday footage, have you ever wondered how parking lots are sized? How do real estate developers know they need exactly 2,000 spaces for a Walmart Home Depot anchored shopping center? Well, the truth is they don't know exactly, but are required to build those spaces by a local government. 
Nearly every local government's zoning code includes a section on parking minimums, or the minimum number of parking spaces that particular land use is required to provide. Here's a look at the parking minimums in the Roseville Zoning Code. They are functionally very similar to any set of parking minimums anywhere in the U.S. For residential uses, the parking minimums are usually listed by unit or by bedroom. Here you can see that a housing developer is required to provide 1.5 parking spaces per studio, which seems high for a tiny unit. That's 192 square feet of parking, not including aisle space. It's close to the size of a small studio itself. Commercial developments usually calculate their parking requirements by square feet of retail space. If you look through them, they can seem a little arbitrary. Banks need one parking space for 250 square feet, while an amusement park needs one per 200 square feet. And bars need one parking space per 50 square feet. There's definitely an ethical problem requiring so much parking and therefore driving to a bar. The part of these minimums relevant to our shopping centers is down here. It says for general retailers, the developer needs to provide one space per 300 square feet. But shopping centers like the one we're interested in need one space for 200 square feet. Where do these parking minimums come from? Where do they get these numbers? Truthfully, nobody really knows. Donald Shoup, a UCLA professor and parking guru, calls planning for parking a pseudoscience. He wrote a whole wonderful book on parking that I highly recommend. He uses the example of funeral parlors to demonstrate the inexact science of developing parking minimums. How many parking spaces should a funeral parlor have? Some cities say 1 per 100 square feet, while others say 3 per parlor, or 10 per parlor, or 30 minimum, or 1 per 5 seats in the chapel. They are all based on different things and assume different numbers of parking spaces. Developers can make the problem worse. There is an assumption that when you go to a store in a suburban area, there will be a parking spot available for you somewhere. This was one of the defining characteristics of the suburban shopping mall, the thing that made it so much better than downtown shopping. Retail developers take that to mean that there must be a parking spot available to you every hour of every day of the year, even on the busiest hour of Black Friday shopping. Thus, some parking spaces will stay vacant 99% of the time. If developers want to build so much parking, why have parking minimums at all? Why not just let the market decide? The concern is about spillover effects. This is what happens when the parking lot fills up and shoppers park in an adjacent parking lot. Without parking minimums, some retailers wouldn't build enough parking and hope to freeload off of nearby parking lots. Parking minimums ensure that each establishment has parking, but it also ensures that each lot will likely have more parking than it needs most of the time. As support for driving and parking begins to erode in dense cities in the United States, some cities have flipped the requirements and now have parking maximums or eliminated parking minimums, at least in certain areas. For example, San Diego eliminated parking requirements for new condos and apartments near mass transit. It went even farther by unbundling the cost of parking. If you buy or rent a unit in these new buildings, you pay separately for a parking space and can opt out to save money by not buying a space at all. Okay, now that we have some parking 101, Let's head to Roseville on Black Friday to check out the parking situation. Okay, I just got here and already it's so crazy. Last time, uh, you know, traffic was a breeze. This time it's crazy. Um, I parked in an overflow parking lot last time and had almost the entire lot to myself. This time the overflow parking is overflowing and people are parking in an adjacent field. So, you know, let's get the drone up in the air and see what we can see. But I'm sure uh, all the parking spaces are going to be taken. So let's check it out. Here's that overflow parking lot from above. You can see the overflow overflow I'm talking about. People have taken it upon themselves to park in the adjacent field. This parking lot is across the street from the fountains, the lifestyle center. What do the parking lots over there look like? Well, unsurprisingly, pretty full. Not many spaces available except for a few patchy areas behind Whole Foods. There are also a few spots in this random section of the lot, but in general, it's probably safe to call the fountains at about 98% capacity. What about the big mall, the Galleria? Remember that overflow parking from last week, the one with no cars in it? It looks a little different now. Totally full. Needless to say, the rest of the parking lot is filled as well. But what about the parking garages? Both of them are completely full on the top level, a completely different look from a week ago. And I think it's safe to assume that all of the parking in the lower levels are full too. Not only that, but you have people queuing up for parking spaces all over the lot. There's even a car parked where it definitely should not be. I'm pretty sure we can consider Roseville 100% maxed out or maybe even 101%, given those cars parked in the field. But what about Natomas? It's a little bit of a different story here. I went at about 3 p.m. on Black Friday. This is the promenade, the vacant, failed Fountains of Roseville copycat. Even on Black Friday, it's a ghost town. It's also not serving as any sort of overflow parking for other retailers. Let's move on to Best Buy and BevMo. We can see that it's pretty busy. There are still some vacant spaces in the main lot, and the two-side overflow lots still have quite a few spaces left. 
To be fair, the parking lot was designed for three retailers, and the middle storefront is empty. If there was a store here, the whole lot would probably be closer to capacity. So let's take a look at the massive Target-anchored strip mall next. We start at the Burlington Coat Factory and Ashley Furniture home stores. Plenty of empty spaces here, and it honestly doesn't even look that much busier than it did last week. This is clearly a case of overbuilt parking over on this side. As we start moving to the left, we see the Big Five Sporting Goods, Michaels, TJ Maxx, and Bed Bath & Beyond. Definitely busy, but also quite a few empty spaces. You're not going to be walking a mile from your parking space to the front door here. It's a little busier than it was a week ago, but not drastically. Target, on the other hand, is definitely quite busy and busier than we saw a week ago. There are a few empty spaces toward Bed Bath & Beyond, but otherwise it's packed, with cars queuing up to snag a spot as soon as people pull out. Traffic into the shopping center isn't too bad, though. No backups or long waits. On the other side of Target is Ulta, Old Navy, Barnes & Noble, and Daiso. These areas are also pretty busy, with only a few spots vacant here and there. At the end of the lot, you see a whole lot more empty spaces, again suggesting that this parking lot may be somewhat too big for what it needs to be. Finally, let's look across the street at Walmart, Home Depot, and the movie theater shopping area. On first inspection, it looks pretty busy, but there are some gaps. This parking area here has quite a few spaces available, probably because they aren't really close to anything in particular. There's also this strange pocket of vacant spaces in front of Staples. I had to check, but yeah, Staples was open on Black Friday. It's like someone put a curse on those spaces and nobody wanted to park there. The Natoma shopping centers were definitely busy, but I put them at maybe about 80% of capacity. Does this mean that the parking lots are overbuilt? Today, yes, but maybe not when the shopping centers and parking lots were first constructed. Online shopping and the general spreading out of holiday shopping means Black Friday isn't as much of a parking outlier. This is a good thing, particularly if parking minimums and retailer parking estimates change too. A more even parking pattern means that the parking lots can be smaller so they don't have to accommodate one big day or even a few big hours each year. And that land that would have went to parking could stay farms or forests or be buildings instead. I chose some pretty big shopping destinations for this little study, but when I was driving around the suburbs on Black Friday, I noticed that some of the minor shopping centers and strip malls had plenty of available parking. Maybe I'll do a follow-up study on smaller neighborhood scale areas next year. My hypothesis is that there will be a much higher vacancy rate there. And if you want to see some really egregious examples of overbuilt parking, Hop on Twitter and check out the hashtag Black Friday Parking. People document the worst parking offenders there. Writing and producing two videos per week makes it easy to get into a little bit of a rut. I tend to do what I'm used to so I can make the video faster. Occasionally, I have to remind myself to learn new skills that I can put to use in these videos. It keeps the video making process from getting too stale for me, and it keeps the videos getting better for you, the audience. When I need to learn a new skill, I turn to Skillshare. I'm always happy to recommend them because I'm absolutely a happy user. I've recently been using Chris Kiscott's animation courses to hone my skills. I haven't put them to use in a video yet, but look out for some improved animation in the future. This is one of many high-quality courses available at Skillshare. The great thing about Skillshare is they have 25,000 classes in everything from design, business, technology, and more. The really great thing about Skillshare is that it's super affordable, and annual subscription is less than $10 per month. Join the more than 7 million learners on Skillshare with a two-month free trial by visiting the link in the description. This also helps support the channel, so thanks for considering it.